It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Hope everyone had a wonderful, safe, healthy, happy, family-uniting Father's Day weekend. Uh, for me, you know, this is one of those holidays never really knew existed until I became a father myself. Um, but it's it's a weekend, and it's a day where I, I think about, one, all the promises that I made to my children and and how uh, how I how I be a better father, uh, and it's also a time where I think about I think about my politics. I think about how I got where I'm at. I think about the positions that I've taken on a lot of social programs, a lot of social policies, and and it goes back to the fact that you know my mother was a teenage mother, uh, my father was a deadbeat. Uh, I don't know his name. I uh, never met him. Never seen. I've never seen him. Uh, I don't think he's ever seen me. And have never, never had any contact with him whatsoever. Uh, don't know his name. Don't want to know his name. And this is one of those moments where you go, um, on this kind of a day, my mind goes into being grateful for the social programs that were there that helped my my mother, who at the time, just a child herself, uh, of, of 16, that then 17 years old, um, helped helped us survive. Uh, we didn't live high off the hog. We didn't, you know, the welfare was not the great living. Uh, the projects that I grew up in were definitely not a great place. Uh, but it was a roof over the head. There was food on the table. Most of the time, uh, we were we were somewhat secure, safe. Uh, and and I think about those programs and the people who want to destroy those programs. And I'm grateful for them because it gave me the opportunity to to survive. Now, over my working career, trust me, I have paid back in, in handsome sums all of the investment our government made in me. Uh, but it's almost like our government is is it's almost part of, uh, it's, it's almost like a father figure in that it helped provide for the things, the basic, simple staples that, that children need uh, to, to thrive and survive. Food, a roof over your head, an education, opportunity. And I think about the kid growing up in the place that I grew up in and wonder if that child's going to have the same kind of opportunities to prosper and to succeed and live, live a life that is worth living. And, and I think about this because I, you know, I, I, I say this all the time. Uh, I have lived a life that as a child growing up could have never imagined. I've done things uh, that as a, as a you know child growing up in the projects could have never fathomed. And now, is that because I didn't have the, uh, the, the, the basis of, 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 of parents who, who you know, ha- wanted great things? Possibly. Uh, but it's, it's also the fact that um, I've been very fortunate and very lucky in a lot of times. And all of us in on a on a day like Father's Day, I I think I think about that good fortune. You know, any of us could have been born like I was into 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 a poverty situation, uh, or worse. Look, I've I've said look, people had it much worse than I did. Uh, but I was able to find a path that made me somewhat successful. Uh, you know, I grew up in a place where there was poverty and 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 danger and. You know, basically man's inhumanity to man. And now I live in a neighbor in a good, solidly upper middle class neighborhood with doctors and lawyers and and and, and the such. Uh, because, you know, I won, worked hard, played by the rules and, and was able to move forward, but also because of my union. The, the reality is the work that I've done over the years uh, has been compensated at a at a level uh, that that gave me opportunities to do things like this. Uh, to start this little program, uh, to help grow this little program, and to to reach people and say, look, this is why I th- what I think is important, and the policies that that I think are really important are those basic social safety net programs that says nobody falls below this this line. We don't let people in the wealthiest country in the history of humanity, we don't let them fall through the cracks. 
Uh, there are policies I would like to see us move on, which would be much, much greater. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, I've said a, a million times, I'm not a huge fan of, of welfare programs, of handout programs. I'm a huge fan of jobs guarantees. Uh, if the private sector can't or won't more likely create enough jobs for working people to have the dignity and respect of a reasonable paying job, then the public sector has to do that. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We could if we had the will, if we had the political uh, wherewithal. Instead, we're fed all kinds of nonsense to tear us apart. And even on a day like Father's Day, there's somebody out there thinking, how can we divide people? Where for me, this is an opportunity to go, look, we should be caring for each other. Because no matter where you are in this moment, things can change. I mean, we saw during the pandemic, you know, people for the first time having to navigate social safety net programs, they never thought they were going to have to. And not knowing how to go about it because we've made them so difficult. We can means test and we, we put hoops and drug tests and all kinds of invasive stuff in the way just to help feed people. It's crazy. And look, uh, imagine you know someone getting a cancer diagnosis or a long-term illness where they can't work. And now you need to go through the, the social security system, the, 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 uh, the, the food stamp programs, the, the lie heap, all of these these hodgepodge of band-aids that are, are supposed to be there to help people when they need it. But we've so muddied the waters because someone who doesn't need it might get it. So for me on Father's Day, I, I think about that stuff. Now, I've been very fortunate. You know, you know, my wife and I had this conversation the other night as we were returning from a concert. Um, I have been fortunate that when we had our three children, uh, I made a promise to myself that they were never going to go hungry, that the, there would never not be food in the house for them to eat. I was never going to look them in the eye and know they were hungry and there was nothing I could do about it. Uh, they were never going to have to worry about where they laid their head. They were never going to be without the, the basic things that they need uh, to be functional in, in a school setting. And I was going to show them as much affection as I can. And I've, I can say I did all those things. And I want all parents to be able to do that, to have the, the ability, the resources to be able to do the things that parents need to do. Because now more than ever, kids need, kids need two parents. They need people who are going to be there. Uh, I think of what my life would have been like had there been uh, a, a second parent. Uh, we probably wouldn't have lived in the kind of poverty we did. Potentially could have had, you know, different, different avenues, but, you know, I probably wouldn't be the person I am today. So who knows? Uh, but on this Father's Day, my mind goes to, I, I want to thank the policymakers of the past who made it possible, who made it possible for me to be able to go, you know what? I worked hard. I played by the rules and I've done okay. So I hope everyone had a good holiday uh, had a good, memorable Father's Day. Hope you had the opportunity uh, to meet with Dad and to, if he's still around and and do the things that uh, that families do on these holidays. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, any stories about Dad? Anything good? Anything uh, that you, you want to pass along? I want to hear it. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Um, gonna take a quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work... For America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. 
Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got to tell you, I, I hate the corporate media. And I think I've said this before. I, I hate corporate media a lot because of the, the nonsense that they spew, uh, because of the, the BS that they, they keep trying to shovel our way. CNN Business, I caught a, a headline uh, day before yesterday. Uh, Amazon is slashing prices on 4,000 grocery items. Uh, They will be joining Target and Walmart. So I read this headline. I'm going, oh my gosh, Amazon slashing prices on 4,000 grocery items. I'm like, did I know Amazon was was a grocery store? Did I know people get their groceries from there? Uh, No, I actually didn't, but they're slashing, they're slashing items. And my mind goes, well, wait a second. You know, they could have kept the prices low from the beginning. They didn't have to raise them because their profit margins haven't really gone down. In fact, their profits, wow, have grown enormously over the last couple of years. You think about the the year before the pandemic, you know, 2019, their profit was, what, $114 billion, almost $115 billion dollars. Uh, that's profit. That's not that's not operating on expenses. It's profit. Uh, 2020, the year of the pandemic, 100 and, almost $153 billion. 2021, pushing $198 billion. 2022, 226, almost $226 billion. And you know, 2023, over $270 billion. In fact, first quarter of 2024, um, you know, ten billion dollars just in that that year that quarter profit, and you go, um, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and and look, I'm tired of hearing about you know corporations are doing the right thing. No, they've been lining their pockets for a while. Their profits have gone through the through the ceiling, and yet we've got our mainstream corporate controlled media going. Oh look, how wonderful. Amazon slashing prices on 4,000 items. What about the other 50,000? Oh, that, no, no, bridge too far. And, and I saw this video of Warren Buffett who said that his company paid $5 billion in taxes last year. And he made the simple, the simple statement. He goes, look, if the top 800 companies in the country did that, uh, if, you know, the, the profitable companies, you know, your, your big ones on Wall Street, if, if they did that, you and me and working people wouldn't have to pay payroll taxes. You wouldn't have to pay taxes. There's enough money there to, to, to operate most of our government. And, you know, he goes into this thing about how, you know, they did a survey in the office, found out that the secretary was paying a rate higher than he was. And you go, when the secretary is paying a higher tax rate than the CEO, problem, and maybe something that would be, I don't know, something that working people would go, um... This is wrong. But here's the weird thing. This is this is societal grooming. This is that constant indoctrination. And it's incredibly powerful. The narrative that we've been sold about, you know, corporate, you know, power and the need to, you know, to give give the smart people all the money. because uh, we need we need a tax code that is gonna benefit, you know, you know, trickle down. And you go, but but hold on, wait a second. <laughs> Help me here, because I'm struggling. Um, they're the ones with all the money, because we've given it to them. We've created a billionaire class, uh, larger than any I would argue probably uh, in history, and we've given them such outweighted power in our country to be able to to, to do I think virtually anything they want. Uh, we have a terrorist organization this, in this country, in my view, called the Business Roundtable, who could crash our economy if they so wanted. And I would argue we're living under some of that policy now because they've chosen to raise prices because they can, because it's good for their bottom line, and it's good for their their pockets. We see this massive CEO pay. We see all of these, these corporate scams stock buybacks. We see all of this extracting wealth from working people and consumers and putting it into the pockets of of the wealth class, the shareholder class, the ownership class. And I look at this pay package that Elon Musk got. Uh, Evidently, back in 2018, you had uh, the the shareholders 
uh, there at Tesla going, yeah, yeah, our, our, our CEO is worth, you know, gazillions of dollars. And the court said, no, I don't think so. That's that's crazy. It's a bit crazy. And now you've got the shareholders who voted 72% of them. 72% um, voted to, uh, to give him what amounts to about a $47 billion windfall. Now, the price of the shares will fluctuate. They'll go up and down. But you're talking about a $47 billion. And I know, I know, I've, I've, I've seen Moneyball. I've seen the Brad Pitt movie Moneyball. It's not about the money. It's what the money says. I get that. I understand. But this is saying that we're going to give one guy an enormous, an enormous amount of power that we haven't done in this country in decades, probably since John D. Rockefeller. And there isn't a big enough push to stop this. For me, the fact that the the wealth class, this incestuous pool of wealth, said, yeah, we're going to take from those workers. We're going to raise the prices on consumers. We're going to do all of these things so that we can ensure that 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 Elon's wealth cared for. Now, of course, ourselves, too. Is, is quite remarkable. And it's it's one of these things where you go, for me anyway, this is why we, we need to dig up Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, we need to go back to the good socialist President Ike's uh, tax policies. So that, look, you can you can give Elon Musk a hundred gazillion dollars a year, give up whatever you want, but we're gonna tax it at 92%. And we're gonna use that money for the betterment of society and not for the betterment, betterment of one person. You know, for me, that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. Maybe we make uh, education more affordable. Maybe we make health care more affordable. Maybe we start spending more money on, I don't know, infrastructure, you know, you name it. Maybe pay our debt instead of running up massive amounts of debt so that we can enrich the wildly wealthy. Because, you know, you go back to Amazon, you know, because they're lowering their prices. Uh, maybe ha they, they pay some of their taxes because on the enormous amount of profit that they make, uh, they pay a, an effective tax rate. Uh, what did I see? Somewhere between one and nine percent. Because now, again, I'm not saying they did anything illegal. I'm saying that they've got an enormous amount of wealth that they can lobby to get the, the loopholes and the gimmicks and the uh, the things that they want so that they don't have to pay so much. So that they get more. And it goes back to what I've always said about government. And it's not me who said it. My high school government teacher back in eighth grade. Uh, you know, government decides who gets what. And what we're deciding right now is working people, you're not getting anything that you need. And this is where the anger should be focused in the right direction. The, the focus should be at these CEOs who are lining their pockets. Uh, the ones who have sold us on this idea of trickle-down economics. But are we surprised that the shareholders went and, and gave Elon this, this, huge, this huge handout? No, we're not surprised at that. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be shocked at all. But it got me thinking about, you know, the indoctrination of the American worker. And this idea of trickle-down, this idea that uh, if, we, if we, we can't tax the wealthy... Because you know they know what they're smart. They know what to do with the money. They're gonna they're gonna create jobs. They're gonna invest in the economy. They're, they're gonna do all this wonderful stuff, and it'll it, it'll it'll trickle down on us, you know, like like manna from heaven, uh, like rivers of gold and honey, and you know, this idea that if we tax rich people, they won't be able to invest. They won't create opportunities for you to get that um, moderately minimum wage job. Or, or my other one that's one of my favorites. You know, you know, we're we're simply just incentivizing success. You know, by giving them more opportunity to hoard more wealth. Um, you know, they're gonna work hard, which is nonsense. Because understand, you go back to the fabulous fifties, where you had a ninety-two top, ninety-two percent top marginal tax rate, uh, where everyone was paying higher taxes, and we were redistributing it in a way that that did invest in the country and pay for our wars, of course. Um, the economy grew much faster. The, the economy was much more widely shared. 
And now we've been sold this this Reaganomics, this supply side voodoo Reaganomics for what? We're, we're almost pushing 50 years, 45 years now. And the thing is, is, you know, we keep hearing these these fear moments. You know, if you tax the rich, they're just going to shut down and they're going to move. They're going to close all the businesses and they're going to move. They're going to take their money and they're going to leave because they've got the money. And some may, some may go and you go, good luck. You know, how, let, let me know how it works out in another country. But if you come back, we're going to tax, we're going to tax you with penalties too. Um, but this idea that, you know, if we tax rich people, it's the same thing with the minimum wage. If you raise the minimum wage, you're going to lose, they're going to lose jobs. Not true. Uh, but, you know, you stop and think about some of the other arguments. Well, it's not fair to tax people. Uh, it is. It is, actually. Most societies throughout history, uh, the stronger do more work. You know, go back Go back to the caveman days. Uh, the one who could carry the most water back to the cave did. Uh, it was that simple. You didn't have the scrawny guy carrying all the water and the big burly guy carrying a thimble. It's not how it worked. But, you know, it, it doesn't end. I mean, the 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 rationales for continuing to give rich people more and more and more and that they're somehow smarter and they know how to use it better. Or my, my one of my favorites is, you know, they're philanthropic. You know, wealthy people, they, they, they fund charities. And I'm like, how about we don't need charities? How about your labor pays for what you need? How about we have a government that creates enough jobs for people so that they don't need handouts? That they can have the dignity and self-respect that comes with work. That they can do things for themselves. How about that? But again, we keep hearing all these, you know, government's inefficient, private interests are so much more efficient. Nonsense. But these are the things that we've been we've been sold. You're gonna you're gonna shut down global innovation. No more competition. If you tax rich people, it's all bad. And the reality is, if you tax rich people, you get to use the money in ways that benefit society. And it's something we we better start coming around to. Because as a society, we got to think about the we instead of just the me. Now, what I would like us to see, see us do, give Elon his $47 billion in stocks. Uh, but, you know, I think we should be adding a massive uh, you know, financial uh, transaction tax on stocks that are high frequency traded. Yeah, you want to you go trading those stocks off? You want to, just to make pennies? We're going to tax shot it. Bring in some money. We close the carried interest loophole so that executives especially big financial executives who are avoiding paying you know, billions of dollars in taxes. We go after that. Uh, we tax CEOs like Elon Musk, who his, his compensation is, you know, many multiples of what the frontline workers is. And we, we change what is considered compensation. We don't just go, oh, well, he didn't realize the share price. He didn't sell it off, so you can't tax something you didn't realize. Nonsense. You absolutely can and should, because they never sell them. That's how they stay wealthy. They borrow money against it. They write off the interest on the loans, and you end up paying for that too. The game has been rigged, and this is where the, my Tea Party friends were right. Working people are taxed enough already. We need to be taxing these people. So when you have a CEO who's making a thousand times what the person on the factory floor is making, or five thousand, or ten thousand times, you know what? It's time we it's time we raise we raise that up. And understand, and I've I've said this before. I am a tax and spend liberal. I believe we tax the very wealthy, big corporations, and we use that money in a way to better society, to do the things collectively we can't do individually pave roads, build schools, build hospitals, defend the country, do all of those things and do them well. Make sure they're well funded, make sure that they're well taken care of. Everything else we leave to the individual. It's not hard to it's not hard to think about. What I am not is a borrow 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 and then complain conservative uh, borrow a boatload of money, give it to the very wealthy in the hopes that maybe the pie gets higher or whatever. And oddly enough, we just keep adding to the debt. I'm not one of those. 
So I think we do need to be raising taxes on the very wealthy. And another great place to start would be, uh, I know President Biden has, has done some of this, a very small uh, tax on, on stock buybacks. Uh, I think it's 1%. I'm like, well, you, you open the door. Good. Uh, how about we just kick it off the hinges? How about we treat that like we would treat, I don't know, the secretary that's working at, at Warren Buffett's company. Uh, maybe we start charging the tax rates on all income for rich people the same rate that it is for working people. Or, to be honest, much like Eisenhower did, at a much higher rate. Because again, from those who much is given, much is expected. Because understand, things aren't working. Wages have been stagnant and declining for 40, 50 years because we've been trying this experiment. Got to give the rich people all the money. We've got to maximize shareholder wealth. We've done that. We got massively wealthy shareholders. In fact, so many wealthy people that they're they're taking Supreme Court justices on vacation, paying for their great great grand nephew or whatever uh, to, to to go to school. Uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, buying RVs and all the other crazy stuff that that's gone on. You know, a million dollar fishing trip to Alaska. I, it's crazy, but it's the stuff that happens. Maybe if we tax them in a way that you go, well, that's that's a bit too much money. Maybe things are a little better. Maybe if we were to bring society back together in that in that kind of we're in the same arena, you know, not in the same seats, but at least in the same ballpark, like we had, you know, from the end of World War II up until you know the the mid to late seventies, up until the Reagan era really kicked off and took off. It's a start. And something we should be pushing and striving for. So when I see the headline, Amazon's cutting prices, how wonderful. I think nonsense. It's ridiculous that they were allowed to raise them through the roof to begin with, along with all the other ones that have gouged our eyes out. Maybe we start holding them accountable, and maybe we have a political system that wants to do that. And maybe, here's a better idea, we have a voting populace who demands it. So when you go to the polls, maybe say, you know what? I want someone held accountable. I want someone to have to, I want someone to have to pay. Seems simple to me. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. Always want to hear it. Uh, also, make sure, I hope everyone had a good, happy Father's Day. Going to take a quick break. When we come back, Bob Ney is going to be here, former Ohio congressman and political analyst, to share some, some tough thoughts of the day. Back after this. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. <laughs> So again, hope everyone had a good Father's Day weekend. Uh, as I said, you know, it's one of those holidays that, you know, as a kid, I never uh, didn't even know there was such a thing. Uh, but now that, you know, I'm I'm a, a parent, you know, it's uh, the kids always do a very nice thing. And, and I, I always, always appreciate it. Uh, but here to share some thoughts on the top stories of the day and all, maybe a little bit on Father's Day. Uh, obviously, he's a father as well. That's why I've asked our good friend Bob Nay to come talk with us. Former Ohio Congressman, political analyst. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, thank you, Rick. Happy Father's Day. Back at you. So uh, so how did you spend uh, the big Sunday? Well, kind of interesting Father's Day week. Now, my father passed away October 22nd of uh, uh, 2022. He was 99 in three months, and we had him bright as could be and active for 99 years and three months. So I missed him. But uh, we were talking about him today and you know, quite fond uh, uh, of the memories that we have of him and also the fact that we had him for so many Father's Days. So I drove on Saturday, and you would know this be, being an Ohioan, I drove from basically St. Clairsville, Ohio, Ohio near Weeding, West Virginia, to Bowling Green to pick up my granddaughter who was at Buckeye Girl State. And she was elected municipal judge. They have the, you know, uh, trials and the legislature and it's really cool and drove her down. So I drove for six hours in one day, Saturday. And then today we had a picnic with my kids and my six grandkids and got some gifts. So great day. 
Very, very, very nice. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, again, it's one of those, those important moments that I think we, you know, us political junkies, we, we kind of sometimes forget, uh, sometimes mm-hmm. forget the importance. Uh, and it, I figured it'd be nice to, to spend a minute on it. You know, I spent time with the kids and, you know, we, we had dinner and did all those things, the things that you nice. do. So very, very nice. Well, let's get to the craziness because, oh, 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 I'm sure you've noticed it's it's got it's getting crazier. Um, oh. Michael Cohen evidently has decided that he's going to run for Congress against Jerry Nadler. Not this time around, but but down, down the road. Yeah. Now, normally I don't laugh at anybody running anymore because it, in this upside down world, who knows? But Cohen is just a complete disaster for a multitude of reasons. And he's going to run. Now, here he was, the Trump lawyer. Then he you know, went against Trump, and then he got convicted, et cetera, et cetera. Not that convicted people can't run. So I'm not saying that. But Cohen is running, announcing now, uh, you know, before the general election's over with, that Jerry Nadler, who I served with, who's chairman of the Judiciary Committee, he's been in New York for a long time, is announcing that in 2026, Cohen's going to run against him because he's been there 30 years and enough is enough. I can smell this run a mile away. You can (laughs) smell it. Cohen is doing this for one reason only, to see how much money he can get his hands on. He's not doing it to exonerate himself. He's not doing it because he cares about that district in New York. When you have these campaign funds, and you know this, Rick, how the Federal Elections Commission uh, system runs. I used to oversee it when I chaired House Administration. The broad statement is you can use campaign funds for the furtherance of your political career. Now, when I left Congress, for example, I took my campaign account and I donated to a a Cleveland... uh, men's uh, house where they were coming out of prison and I donated some money to that, you know, and I donated some money to a recovery center to get rid of the campaign money I had. I could have technically kept that money, by the way. I did keep a portion because we had things in storage and I had to pay the storage costs of, of, you know, the the, uh, political things I was storing. Now, I could have kept that money, though, to this day. Uh, I think it was $40,000. I could have kept it. And I could have leased a car, could have hired somebody part time to do campaign work. I could have used the money to travel to do a fundraiser in Las Vegas or attend a fundraiser in Las Vegas, long as you don't directly use it for personal money. But I could have rented a room out of my apartment and paid for that room. So, therefore, indirectly subsidizing myself. Yeah. I bring up these issues because I suspicion. The good Mr. Cohen wants to, you know, he's broke, so he wants to make some money. Are, are you questioning his good, sincerely held <laughs> beliefs and his, his good intentions? Uh, I think oh, yeah. I think all of us are, to be honest. But, you yeah. know, it's not surprising. You know, at least yeah. I'm not surprised by it. Uh, because look. you look at Trump, uh, who, mm-hmm. you know, understand, Cohen was Trump's fixer. He sure. learned a lot from Trump, so I would assume a lot of the same similar behavior um, you know, look, you know, Trump's made a lot of money off of being president, running for political office. Uh, you know, people staying at his hotels. He's basically leasing his plane out as a charter service for Secret Service agents. I mean, he's figuring out how to how to line the pockets. Yeah, and there's another thing. Potentially, if Cohen keeps at this and he becomes an irritant, maybe he tries to privately go to the Democrat powers to be and says, hey, help me out a little bit. Uh, I need a little bit of business. I need a little job. I'll get out of this thing against Jerry Nadler, in which case they should tell him to go pound sand. But he he might be thinking these things. There is no logical reason, none, for this guy to be running. Well, running maybe, but just not for office. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you know, look, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. And we got, we got a couple of years to let it work out. You know, right. Nadler may not even be running in two years. So, uh, we'll see. Uh, now the, the president, um, you know, president Biden said that, uh, uh the next president's going to name two Supreme court justices possibly, uh, can my mind immediately goes, can you imagine how bad that could be, uh, with a Trump in, in the white house, that he would be the guy who would potentially nominate five Supreme court justices, uh, that, yeah. to, that to me is just frightening enough for people to go vote against him. 
Well, it could happen. Now, here's the problem. That statement they made, which is potentially accurate, which then would make the court overwhelmingly you know, conservative, uh, should bother, obviously, a lot of people. Now, it will help, I think, with the political uh, intertwined system, the Democrat chairs in the counties throughout the nation, in the states. You know, I, I think it will help with that. It'll help with some money raising. But unfortunately, for most of the general public, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be off, off into another area, which I think is the um, economy and the, uh, the border and the, the inflation, the balance, the budget for the country or not, those types of issues. Abortions in there, too, I understand. But it's a big deal issue, but it never really gets pushed to the level it needs to be pushed to. We used to do it at, you know, what we call the Lincoln Day dinners with Republicans of why should you elect a president? Because they appoint the Supreme Court. So we try to get that message out there. It's important for them to focus on it, but I'm just not sure every average person is going to make it the top of their. See, I, I remember yeah. 2016 and 2016, the Republicans were Republican voters were keenly aware uh, oh, that yeah. the Supreme Court was in play. They were keenly right. aware they, they got the stolen seat from Garland, uh, but also potentially that there were a couple of older ones, older justices that would be potentially retiring or mm -hmm. you know passing on. And I remember because they've got the microphone and the platforms to be able to spread that in a much yeah. better way than the Democrats do, yeah. that their Absolutely. voters were keenly aware of it. So it may oh, be boy. true. The Democrats, maybe, maybe Biden's people may be spot on. Uh, I think the reason it's not top of mind for most people is they're not being hammered with it by the Democratic messaging. Well, true. And therefore, the taking the majority, the taking of the majority for the House and the Senate then becomes very important also because the only way to really fight Supreme Court, court decisions is to codify the law, which happened after Roe v. Wade was overturned. There were votes, including 43 Republicans in the House, if I remember right, to codify same-sex marriage, because when that happens, it makes it a little bit dip more difficult for the Supreme Court to undo something. Right. So if the, if the White House is not taken, then uh, it, it would be really, really important, probably in the next election included and the next one after that, because of the Supreme Court and when people would you know, leave or die or whatever, it would be more important for the uh, majorities, uh, obviously, if you're a Democrat, to to remain or to build majorities for the House and Senate. Yeah, I mean, this this is such a screwy election cycle. Uh, oh. You know, I keep seeing this this new thing, uh, the double haters. Uh, and the double haters, they keep rising. And I guess this is a construct of our uh, our corporate media because we've got to have a horse race for this, ra this, this race. Um, so, you know, we got the double haters out there, the people who hate both of them. And to be honest, you know, you look at uh, some of the things that, that Trump has done. I can see it. For instance, you know, he, he calls out Biden for he wants both of them to take a cognitive, uh, cognitive test. I know where you're going. Go and, and then forgets the doctor who who administered him that test. He forgot it was Ronnie Dr. Jackson. Dr. Dr. Johnson. Yeah, it's, it's not Johnson. <laughs> um, but so it's just it's one of those things where the irony is so thick. Well, there's a lot of parallels here, and you anger both sides by saying this, I guess. You had classified documents, and the way Trump handled it was different, but then Biden had them, and, and you Trump fumbles, Biden fumbles. And it just it sort of parallels, you know, the, the audience, I guess, uh, for something that happens. And yeah, and you're right, Trump's accusing uh Biden of not taking the cognitive test. He took the best test ever in the history of the United States and, you know, thanking his physician, Johnson, yeah. which was Jackson. And, but then again, tomorrow Biden will say something. And, you know, each one of them uh, just eventually, a week won't pass with one of them saying something that somebody fact checks. Yeah, and, but here's my problem with all this. You know, while we're, while we're focusing on the distraction, while we're focusing on, you know, the, uh, you know, the irony of uh, we go, we're going to we're going to take cognitive tests, but not remembering who gave you the test and all this mm -hmm. stuff. We're not talking about any issues. We're not talking about how you're going to make people's mm -hmm. lives better. And look, yeah. you know, I look at the economy. The economy is for <clears throat> for a lot of people, you know, doing 
pretty well. Uh, a lot of working people are struggling. Inflation's you know still higher than I would like. Um, but you know we're be this. Th- Help me here because, you know, I'm looking at things and unemployment's low and wages are going up. There's a lot of good news out there. But all I keep seeing is is negativity and and well, um, division. Stock markets up 10 percent, too. You know, uh, that's another thing. But I think here's some bottom lines and you raise a great point. This election is being gaslighted and it's, you know, Donald Trump is going to destroy democracy. He's mean. He's vicious. He's going to take revenge. He's going to put everybody in jail. Joe Biden is not going to make a second term. You know, he's going to pass out. He's going to quit. He's going to get sick. Kamala Harris is going to be there and on and on and on, you know, with those scenarios. So you you keep getting these things. And then Trump makes a mistake and Biden makes a mistake. Trump slips, Biden slips, et cetera. And you're right. Then the media goes crazy on this stuff. How did they move? How did they talk? What did they say? You know, they, they go crazy with it. But you're you're correct that the substantive issues are just being thrown by the wayside. But here is something that really has to be looked at. And I, I believe this is messaging. You're right about the market. You're right about inflation. You know, uh, interest rates didn't go down. They, you know, have still held where they're at with the Fed Reserve. Maybe next year they will. But on top of all of this, uh, a trend of, African-American voters, uh, young young voters and Latino voters are going for Trump. Now, I don't believe it's because they particularly like Trump. I really don't. When I say they're going for Trump, Biden has lost numbers in those three categories. He's, he's lost numbers. But I believe that a lot of these groups that are now steering towards Trump, doesn't mean they're locked into Trump, by the way but they're veering towards him. I believe it's because they don't know. They don't know who's really going to beat the fist down. And in a strange way, Trump does that. You know, uh, <clears throat> Biden will talk about event first Bidenomics. They got off of that. I just think that they need to, the Biden campaign needs to not only focus on what they've done, but also to focus on how, you know, he wants to lay the hammer down to give working people a chance in this country. I I think working people feel disjointed. Yeah. They feel alone. They you know they they feel that that they don't have a lot of hope. It's not necessarily because of an inflation number. It's just it's out there. It's an attitude. And look, you're you're constantly being inundated on how bad it is. You know, but uh, every day right. I hear people they're on the negative. You know, prices are too high, and and you know they got you know like I know people who got you know substantial raises. And still, they're they're never going to be happy. So negativity sells. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I look at this meeting that Trump had with the business roundtable last week. You know, it's one of these things where my mind starts going into places where, you know, how much of this stuff is rigged uh, at that business roundtable? Uh, how much of these prices have been been elevated artificially to line their pockets and and kept there just to keep that messaging going, so that you do get that bleed off. Now, look, I look at those polls and I go, you know, I'm not paying attention to any of that until Labor Day. Uh, most mm-hmm. people don't most people don't bother until Labor Day. And we'll mm-hmm. see how those communities come around or don't. Mm-hmm. If if it stays the way you're saying it is, Biden's got real problems. But mm-hmm. I got to think come come after Labor Day. I got to think that that ship will write itself. I, mean, I, I don't think this is like I've told people that say Trump can't win. Yes, he can. No, I, I'm with you. Yeah. And then they say, you know, Biden can't win. Yes, he can. I think if you took and and I don't live in, you know, you know me, I don't live and breathe by polls. When I was in office, I didn't do it. You use them as a snapshot at the time. And right now, I think if you combine every single poll and group and everything together, I believe that President Biden is a point or two ahead. Now, his, you know, his likability rate is not high, but I think he's a point or two ahead which if that's a little bit of an error, then it could be, a, you know, an, an even match. So that gives both of them an opportunity to grab the people who are truly confused. Look, I have had a lot of friends who have said to me point blank, they really don't like either one. They're going to vote. They just don't know what they're going to do yet. And I think those people, if they get a phone call on a poll, people are like, oh, yeah, I'm going with Trump. Maybe if they get a phone call five days later, I'm going with Biden. Right. 
So no. I think there is a lot of of fluid, uh, you know, fluid nature to this right now. Do we see a third party? I mean, I just saw a, a CNN story that uh, in in a political poll uh, or a CNN poll, uh, RFK Jr. has hit fifteen percent, mm-hmm. and that ev- evidently uh, that's uh, the threshold that he needs to get on the, the debate stage. If he gets a fourth, um, a fourth one of these 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 polls to say 15%, he could be on the debate stage. Yes, and I don't buy into, personally, I don't buy into, well, RFK totally hurts Trump or he totally hurts Biden. I think it's a wash. I think he takes a certain percentage from Trump, and I think he takes a certain percentage from Biden. Now, RFK is, you know, because people not in the political system, I know you've had this question asked of you when he first started running. People say, well, he's a Kennedy. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. The Kennedy family is going to endorse Biden. Yeah. So he's not your you know, typical Kennedy Democrat, obviously. But he still takes votes, I think, from different groups that may not even like him so much, but they don't like the other two candidates. And if he gets on that debate stage, depends how he performs, uh, it, it could get very interesting. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the debate. Uh, again, I'm. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to see how the fact checking goes uh, for that debate. Well, I, I I think there's a couple of things that, you know, President Biden is going to have to handle carefully. Not Trump because Trump doesn't care, and he doesn't. And but there's certain things that you know President Biden will have to try to you know stay stay focused on but this debate i think is a big deal not that it's going to swing 10 percent away from either candidate but i think it's a it's a big deal to continue to set a tone until the fall of you know where some of the people are going to stand that that don't care for either one of them i i think it, it'll be interesting for that aspect it's an important debate and by the way Personally, I do not believe for one second either candidate's going to drop out of the debate. No, I don't that. <laughs> no, I, 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 I keep hearing that stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. It, it, uh, I, I, I've, I've heard it more on the Trump side that right. Trump's got him his way out. There's no way Trump is dropping out of this, in my view. Uh, but no. we, but we will see. Uh, but Bob, as always, I appreciate the time, the information, the thoughts. Good stuff. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all your listeners. Back at you, our good friend Bob Nay. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. I'll take a quick break. Right back to wrap things up. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1972. That was the day that nine firefighters gave their lives in the line of duty in Boston, Massachusetts. The tragedy occurred at the historic Hotel Vendome. Built 100 years earlier, the hotel stood in Boston's Back Bay, one of the most historic neighborhoods in the city. The building was undergoing renovations and being converted into condominiums. A small cafe was open on the first floor, but the rest of the building stood empty due to the construction. On that fateful afternoon, workers noticed smoke. They sounded the alarm and 100 firefighters rushed to the scene. Within two hours, the fire was contained. Three engines remained for cleanup. Then, without warning, a portion of the building collapsed. 17 firefighters were trapped beneath two stories of debris. Nine firemen were killed, leaving behind eight widows and 23 children. No cause of the fire was ever determined. But it was found that the reason for the collapse was that a support column had been weakened during the renovation. 25 years later, a memorial to these heroes was unveiled, remembering the greatest loss of life in the history of the Boston Fire Department. In 2002, Bruce Springsteen released the song Into the Fire in honor of the firemen who gave their lives on 9-11. It's a song that stands tribute to those whose daily work is running towards danger, not Away from it. Dark to see, healing like you be. You lay your hand on me, walk into the darkness of your smoky grave. Up a slide, into the fire. Yeah, 
Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, thericksmithshow.com. So, I, a listener sent me a video of of a woman doing one of the talking points, or what is it, TP, uh, Turning Point, is it? Turning Point USA. I guess this is the, the right-wing group that's out there uh, floating a whole bunch of... Uh, it's, it's kind of like an infomercial. I mean, uh, sent me some video clips of their conference, and it, it really is... It's it's that kind of weird marriage between what QVC used to be, always selling you something and always kind of trying to you know trying to hock something off on you, and and uh, just trying to keep you paying attention uh, with, with with the most ridiculous nonsense. But I happened to watch this video of this woman selling water, uh, and, and I'm going, really selling water? It's just not water, though. It's Freedom Water 2.0. <laughs> and I'm like, one, uh, I remember when the whole bottled water thing came out, and I go, who would be dumb enough to buy bottled water? Uh, but definitely we do. Uh, I remember as a kid, there were drinking fountains all over the place, and you could just drink out of the hose or out of the tap, which, oddly enough, tap water is is actually probably better than most of the stuff that you're going to buy, especially Freedom Water 2.0, which leads you to believe that there was a Freedom Water 1.0 that wasn't as good. It's water. Anyway, hawking the water because, well, we, they need money. They're begging for money. And and, and what what's interesting, and this is one of the things that Alex Jones Uh, as he's losing all of his fortune, and and good for him, Um, as they're liquidating, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars that he fleeced the flock out of um, and handing it over to the the people that he uh, defamed, harassed, and did all the stuff he did there and uh, with the Sandy Hook families. Um, It got me thinking about, you know, the reality is, is our politics isn't about making people's lives better. It's not about the policies that are going to to change lives and and help people. You know, as I talked about at the beginning of the hour, uh, it's not about that at all. It's about getting you to buy stuff. It's about to get you to buy freedom water. You know, for you know, it's water. It's freaking water. And and it's not a joke. I mean, they're very serious. This is how they make their living, which is why they keep pushing it every you know every ten minutes. Got to get freedom water. <gasps> freedom water. And, and like I said, you know, the reality is, is these aren't true conservatives. What these are, these are, these are in, infotainers. Uh, these are people who are looking to fleece the flock to line their pockets. You know, one of the things she said that grabbed my attention, and, and look, this is what the right has done masterfully. They have trained their, their flock uh, to believe that her line was, with every sip, you're making a statement. It's not about it's not about your thirst. It's not about quen, quen, quenching your thirst or any of that stuff. Sprite already has that, I guess. Um, this is about you're making a political statement with water. <laughs> you're drinking freaking water, uh, but it's freedom 2.0 water. And you know, again, that person is lining their pockets with the money. And it, it got me thinking about a lot of the people I know who wear the the garb. They got the hat, they got the shirts, they got the bags, they got the you know the stickers, stickers galore, uh, you know flags. Oh my gosh, flags everywhere. And you go, how much money did you spend on this stuff? Now these are people who are complaining that the economy sucks and the, you know the prices are too high, but they'll drop fifty bucks on a T-shirt because it says Trump on it. Uh, they'll drop 50 bucks on a flag because, you know, don't don't tread on my shoes. It's quite remarkable. And the people who are, who, are, who are laughing all the way to the bank are the people who don't care ideologically at all. Just as long as they can keep stoking the fire, keeping people at each other, pitted against each other, arguing so that, you know, you can you can make a statement with every sip, with every bite, with every shirt you you change, with your underwear, with your toilet paper, you're making a statement. You're telling America what kind of a, a patriot you are. And they they pump that up. 
to the point to where people are buying things simply because they they believe this is why I'm a true American. And and oddly enough, this is the part that blows my mind. Oddly enough, most of this stuff is made in China. Yeah. Because uh, I do ask somebody, can I see your, your red hat? Yeah, made in Honduras. It's quite remarkable what we, what, what, what we tell ourselves. Stop being fleeced. And this is why, you know, I I look at this and I go, I, I, I hope we change soon. Hope we wake up. Uh, but for now, freedom 2.0. <laughs> I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. And as always, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email rick at rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show where working people come to talk.